mitochondrial function. Your mitochondria are little the powerhouses in your cell and they help generate ATP, which is the, the cellular currency of energy, so to speak. And we're going to talk about natural ways to improve mitochondrial function. Evan, how are we doing today, man? I'm doing really well. I think first let's dive into some of the big assaults that we have as a modern society on our mitochondria. And that could be anything from viruses, bacteria, parasites, gut infections, mm -hmm. pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, plastics, phthalates, the BPA, the BPS, flame retardants, non-stick chemicals, car exhaust, air pollution. Did I miss any? I mean, I think you hit a lot of them. I would say being sedentary is a lot of mitochondria in your muscles. And if you don't do enough, you don't put enough force to those muscles, they will atrophy. And so just not doing enough um, not creating enough stimulus on your body that could definitely weaken and decrease your mitochondria in your muscles. So I would say sedentary and inactive uh, resistance through your muscles. Okay. Okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. So you're saying that like just in general, you have to have some level of physical stimulation, physical activity to keep the mitochondria working. I guess it's kind of like an old car that you've sat there and all in your muscles at least. Yeah. Cause if you decrease, you know, your muscle levels via just atrophy due to lack of use yeah your muscles will shrink absolutely and thus your mitochondria will shrink for sure what about creatine do you know anything about the role of creatine in mitochondria because i know when i'm taking creatine i just i feel stronger obviously there's um creatine's used a lot in like bodybuilding world but there's got to be a mitochondrial mechanism there because i'll tell you i feel like i can lift you know at least a good 10 20 pounds heavier on particular exercises with creatine in my system yeah, I mean, creatine definitely has an effect on growth hormone, improving growth hormone, thus that will help with muscle. Creatine is like instant energy for the muscle. So it's it's there. It's ready to be used right away in that first 10 seconds or five, five to 10 seconds of muscle use or like explosion movement through that muscle. So that definitely plays a role in muscle. Um, I'm not sure how it plugs in 100%. Because really, you know, with uh, ATP, right, and the mitochondrial function, if you look inside the mitochondria, you have glycolysis, and then you have the electron transport chain. Or I'm sorry, you have the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, and then that plugs into the electron transport chain. So glycolysis, that's going to be ut utilizing the carbohydrate um, in the muscle, right? Glycogen in the muscle, fast, immediate source. I think creatine plugs into that top part. And then you have the Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, where B vitamins, magnesium, all these different things kind of plug into that and with the with the citric acid or krebs cycle that didn't mean the same thing essentially they're grabbing hydrogens right so they're, they're it's, it's a reducing agent so it's just grabbing re reduce reduction is a gain in electrons and so you have nad goes around and it grabs nadh so you get three nadh and i think one fadh2 so you have fadh and it grabs another hydrogen and that becomes fadh2 and so it's grabbing all these hydrogens and then it's essentially bringing those hydrogens downstream into the electron uh, transport chain and beta beta fatty acid oxidation there. And so you, I think you generate, was it 36 to 39 ATP through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain? Unless you're in like a chronic fatigue state, this cell danger response, and I think you're spitting out something low, like two, maybe three ATP. I've read about this cell danger response. They just call it CDR in the literature, but it talks about how the cell danger response, which could be initiated by trauma or a car wreck or even mold exposure or tick-borne illnesses or viruses. There's a lot of, you know, Epstein-Barr, you'll see the link between like mono and chronic fatigue. It's said that these people are in this state of just a low power output, where even if you have the nutrients, you're just not generating the ATP. It was some, I don't know if it was Kalish or somebody that, that you and I had looked into where there was a talk on this about how the, the, the ATP was literally in the single digits, the low single digit output in some of these states. So the message here is that for people that have chronic fatigue, you got to realize there is a mitochondrial component to this. Why don't we talk about testing a little bit? The main thing that you and I are going to look at is going to be the organic acids. I know there are some other tests out there. I'll admit I've had clients send them to me, such as the mito swab. I've not run the mito swab personally. I don't know enough about it to speak on it much, but I'll just say that it does exist. I believe it is a a mouth swab and it's probably looking at just a couple generic markers in the saliva but we like to use the organic acids test because as you mentioned there's the krebs cycle metabolites on there we can look into the 
uh, succinate or what some people call succinic acid. You've got the malic acid. You've got fumarate. There's other markers on there. And we, we see when people have toxin exposure, like I said in the beginning, the heavy metals, the mold, the pesticides, we'll see those mitochondrial markers go up. And the higher the numbers go, generally, the more tired someone is because that indicates more damage to that Krebs cycle. So so the oat is is huge. And then obviously we'll look at stool too. Now the stool test, you don't measure like the stool test we're running. You're not measuring mitochondrial function, but I look at it in a roundabout way, meaning if you have all these gut infections producing toxins, that could be damaging mitochondria as well. So we know that when we clear the gut out, we see the mitochondrial function improve. 100%. Yep. 110%. I want to just put something on screens. So people can see it here. I think this is really helpful. Have you seen um, or heard about that mito swab before? Have you seen anybody send you those? I have. I've ran a couple of them. Um, it's kind of a binary test. It gives you a result. My, my The issue I have, it's not a lot of actionable information. It's like, okay, you know, there's some issues there, but then now what's, what's the remedy that you're going to plug in from a diet, lifestyle, supplement, uh, toxin reduction, execution, right? What's the next step on it? So that's the problem with some of those tests. I always look and I always ask, well, what's the corrective action based on the test showing you is, is a concern? Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. That's the problem with a lot of them. Like I've seen a lot of these stool testing companies, same thing. There's like so much data. Well, this percent of this bacteria, this percent of that. It's like, what do I do with that? Is that an infection? Is that not an infection? So you and I've seen the same problem in other categories of health tests too. 100%. I want to show a couple things on screen here just so it's crystal clear. Um, where the mitochondria is and how all these different energy pathways plug in. I think it's important. Um, I'm going to pull it up here on screen in just a second so people can see it. Yeah, people listening on audio, they're going to be lost. So just look up Dr. Justin's YouTube page and you'll be able to view some of this stuff. Some stuff like mitochondria gets a bit geeky. The, the main thing here is toxins are a big factor in damaging this cycle and you got to get toxins out reduce exposure where you can and we can run actually chemical tests on your urine too so we could talk about that in a minute absolutely and so if you look here right you have the mitochondria right here this middle parts the mitochondria the outer parts the cytosol so from what i understand like creatine is going to plug more into the cyto cytosol and glycolysis okay uh, but then you're going to see you get about two atp which is adenine triphosphate and this gets broken down to adp and you get energy right and so you have glycolysis, which generates a little bit of ATP, too, and creatine's going to plug more on the outside. Then that goes into your mitochondria. Now you have the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain is part of also the beta fatty acid oxidation. That's how you burn fat for fuel. Okay, and so Krebs cycle, that churns around twice. And essentially what you're doing is you're gathering NAD and FADH2, or NAD and FADH are grabbing hydrogen. So NAD is going to grab a hydrogen making it NADH. FADH is going to grab a hydrogen making it FADH2. So I think you're going to grab, it's like two or three NADHs and then one FADH2. And all those hydrogens then go into the electron transport chain here. And this is where you generate most of your ATP. And again, what comes out? Oxygen comes in. This is why if you're like anemic, right? And you're not carrying oxygen well, that's why you're going to get tired. And this is going to have effect on like your thyroid and your adrenals because the mitochondria is important for energy at all levels. And so if we have anemic issues or we're inflamed because inflammation is going to make it harder to carry oxygen all of, and also nutrition because this electron transport chain, when we run organic acid tests, we can look at citrate, malate, fumarate, succinate. These are important um, metabolic, essentially, um, inputs into the Krebs cycle that correlate with certain nutrients like amino acids, alpha lipoic acid, magnesium, B vitamins. And so we can get a window on how this Krebs cycle is functioning based on the organic acid testing at, at some of those compounds. And then um, also cystoconitate, citrate, right? These are really important. And then in the electron transport chain, we can get a window into things like carnitine and CoQ10 because they also play a major role in the electron transport chain. So we get a good window with how the mitochondrial is function, functioning by looking at the B vitamins and looking at a lot of these nutrients. And so essentially things that can impair this, like you mentioned, pesticides, heavy metals, uh, mold toxins, antibiotics. So all these things can have a negative input, but that's kind of how 
things look. So we have glycolysis is the first part that then goes into the mitochondria. And then we have Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. So these are the big three. If you can kind of zoom out and see how it looks and how it makes sense, um, that should hopefully make more sense to you on that front. Any questions on that, Evan? Well, people listening to that, they're going to be like, wow, this sounds like a really crazy, rare problem, right? This must be just rare. This must be like a one in a million case. And I would say, I'm not going to say 99, I would say 90% of the people we work with, I see some level of mitochondrial dysfunction or damage, either on the chemical profile test. So that's something I alluded to earlier. We can run chemicals. So we can look at gasoline. We can look at xylene. We can look at phthalates all sorts of organophosphates, 2,4-D being a major herbicide. I still see people at Lowe's and Home Depot in the garden aisle buying grass seed. That's called weed and feed. Weed and feed is a grass seed mixed with three different types of herbicide. It's 2,4-D. I believe it's dicamba and glyphosate. I could have mixed one of those up, but either way, it's three different chemicals, very toxic substances mixed with grass seed. And that's like people just buy it and they don't think anything of the term weed and feed. That means you're going to be killing all the good stuff in your soil and poisoning yourself at the same time. It's just not smart. So this mitochondrial thing, my, my point was, this is not rare. Like when you show that image and people see that, like, oh no, that's not happening to me. It's like, it happens every day, all day. I had mitochondrial damage. My latest O test shows my mitochondria are much, much better, but I had significant mitochondrial damage from my mold exposure. Interesting. Very interesting. I wanted to highlight one thing here. So you can see creatine does primarily exist here in the cytosol, right? So if we zoom out, right? Cytosol's outside of the mitochondria, right? Right? glucose pyruvate here so just to do you guys can highlight here creatine does go from the cytosol and it can go into the mitochondria so we did talk about creatine it does primarily happen more in the cytosol outside the mitochondria and it can go in via this micr micrt kind of transport compound so yeah so creatine is a, a compound that we talked about that goes outside but can also go inside the mitochondria too yeah doctor just to plan that that's awesome. Dr. Neil Nathan did a huge thing, 155 page slideshow that people can look up just called the cell danger response. It's very complex stuff. There's going to be maybe a few geeky people that want to dive into that. But for your average person, there's not much takeaways built into that. But if you want to look into more of like the biochemistry side of it, then, then you could look at it. But I think the big summary is it's all it's all the chemicals. And this is a relatively new problem. I mean, we face now over 80,000 chemicals are in the environment, depending on what number you read. And there's only a small amount of those that are even tested. You'll see stuff in Europe, like, oh, Europe has banned these chemicals and makeup and personal care products. But the US, we're very, very far behind. And if you look at the environmental working group, they have a water testing report you can look at and you can plug in your zip code. I mean, just the amount of trihalomethanes, pesticide, herbicide residue, pharmaceutical drugs that are in the municipal tap supply in your city are massive. And you're getting hit with this all the time. If you go to a restaurant and you eat rice, what do you think they make that rice with? They make it with tap water. So you're getting exposed to it that way too, which is why if I go out to eat, I don't really do rice that often anyway. But if I do it, it's going to be at home with good, clean, filtered water. I like it. Anything else you want to say on that? So obviously get the toxin exposure is super important. Uh, hydration, obviously really important too. Uh, anything else you want to say on that? Yeah, you hit, you hit the, the CoQ10. You mentioned some of the markers we're going to look at on the oak test. So we will use those. We have a formula. I believe you've got one too. Uh, mine's called Mito Boost. It's essentially like a multi for the mitochondria with all the CoQ10, ribose, carnitine, B vitamins. So when we see mitochondrial dysfunction, we can supplement that. And we tell people, this is a Band-Aid for your mitochondria. This is not, some of it is root cause, right? If you just are simply low and depleted in CoQ10, one could argue supplementing CoQ10 is root cause. But reality, it was usually, oh, here we go. Let me see if I can share this slide with you. Mainly it was the, the toxins that led to this. So let me share my screen real quick. Uh, and there is going to be, because we do make CoQ10 on our own via the mevalonic acid pathway. And of course, as you get older, just like stomach acid, you're going to make less of it. And so there, there could just be a depletion based on age as well. Does that show up at all on your side, the video? Does that uh, screen share show? Try again. There's like a little bell there. Let me, let me pop it up again. How about that? 
Yes. Oh yeah. Let me let me highlight it. Go ahead. Yeah. There we go. So this is this is kind of what I was alluding to, and many many other people may have different ways to look at this, but this is from Neil Nathan's. He he had a, a great paper on the cell danger response, and it just shows at the top here basically everything I already mentioned, like flame retardants, heavy metals, pesticides, infections. So that would include viral issues as well, mast cells, NK killer cells, cytokines, the microbiome. All these issues here are what really breaks the straw. You know, the, 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 one of these is the final straw that breaks the camel's back. And then you end up in this, what's called the cell danger response phase. And then that's where you get the issues with the mitochondria down regulating. So there's more in that, but like I said, it's 155 pages. It's like, you gotta be, you gotta be, you know, have your bulletproof coffee before you No, that makes that. a lot of sense. So you're kind of really focusing on the toxicity and how that negatively impacts it. I want to just kind of tie in the dietary component. Why is food so important to enhancing the mitochondria? Let me, let me break that down for a second here. This is important. Okay. So this is really important. So we talked about like Krebs cycle, right? And so like, this is our zoom out, right? Th what's happening here. We have glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain outside of the mitochondria with the cytosol inside. Now check this out. This is a good one. This is from the textbook of functional medicine. So we have fats, carbs, and proteins. These are our primary nutrients where everything comes from, right? Fats could be coconut oil, grass-fed butter. It could be fats from um, grass-fed meat, right? Our carbs could be vegetables, fruit, starch, and our proteins could be protein powder or it could be animal protein, right? All of these essentially shuttle downstream. Fats get carried into the mitochondria via carnitine. So if you go into any biochemistry textbook, it's called the carnitine shuttle, right? Every medical doctor, doctorate level person would study this at a graduate level. I studied it as well. Now, in the textbook of, um, I think not Guyton's physiology, but there was another textbook of biochemistry that's common at the graduate level. Do you know what the rate limiting amino acids to make carnitine are? It's methionine and lysine. And so really important, guess what some of the rate limiting amino acids are in a vegetarian diet? <laughs> oh yeah. Methionine well. and lysine are actually very deficient in vegetarian diets. And so this whole process of a carnitine shuttle here, that helps bring carnitine, converts it into acetyl-CoA. So then the actual, it can get inside the mitochondria and run through the citric acid cycle. Again, that's the same thing as Krebs cycle. They have multiple names in medicine for the same thing. It's just meant to confuse people. So citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, this is how we get fat inside the mitochondria is via carnitine. So very important, right? So if we zoom out here, we have energy out here, fat, we get it inside via the carnitine shuttle. Super important there. And then you see carbs, right? Glucose, other sugars. We go pyruvate to lactate. And we need, guess what? B vitamins. So if we're putting in lots and lots of refined processed sugar and we're insulin resistant, we can actually deplete B vitamins. And we can actually deplete a lot of magnesium and other nutrients downstream. So this is really important. Too much carbs, too much sugar, especially if you're insulin resistant and you're putting on weight due to too much carbs, um, that's going to be a problem. And you're going to deplete nutrients. Now, then we have proteins, amino acids. Uh, these all get converted downstream. We also need B vitamin to support that. Now, the difference is if you're eating high quality protein, guess what? You're getting good quality B vitamins in that protein. If you're doing a lot of refined processed sugar, guess what? You're not getting vitamins and nutrients with it. So carbohydrates, it's possible to eat a lot of empty carbs that are actually going to deplete your nutrient levels. Protein, not as much if it's grass fed and organic, right? Now, really, you're taking all these nutrients, fats, carbs, and proteins, you're converting them into acetyl-CoA, okay? You're converting it to acetyl-CoA. And again, we spit off beta-hydroxybutyrate. What's that? That's a ketone. Now, this is important. If we keep our carbs in check, we, we can use ketones for fuel. So this is a really important fuel source for people that are going to be lower carb because we're going to be more keto adapted. We're going to be able to use that. And then you can see here that acetyl-CoA runs around the Krebs cycle twice. We go two turns. Guess what we need? Cysteine, amino acid, iron, really important. So if you're a female, you have heavy bleeding, you're estrogen dominant, you have heavy bleeding, that's going to affect energy. Um, magnesium, manganese, B vitamins, lipoic acid, magnesium, B vitamins, B vitamins, tyrosine, phenylalanine, aspartate, um, glycine, histidine, arginine, proline, 
glycine, valine, methionine, right? These are all amino acids over here. So we need amino acids to run these systems. We need B vitamins, we need magnesium. And then of course, once we pump these things around, here's our NADH and then our FADH should be somewhere as well. So here, NADH, they may not, they may just be oversimplifying it, not showing it, but we have NADH here and we should have an FADH2 coming in. This all goes right into, guess what? This is the electron transport chain and beta fatty acid oxidation right there, right? This is now, now hydroxymethylglutarate. This is CoQ10. This is where CoQ10 comes in and this is where it runs through the electron transport chain and uh, burning fat for fuel. And we generate our 36 to 38 ATP from all these three sources, one, two, and three. And so that's what's happening in your mitochondria. And so just to kind of highlight macronutrients, fats, protein, carbs, very important. Two, don't junk it up with all the toxins that you mentioned. And then of course, making sure we can break down protein, make sure we're getting enough iron, making sure we're not anemic, right? All of those things kind of flow into allowing all these pathways to, to work optimally. That's amazing. I love the breakdown of that. The visual is super helpful. So just to clarify a little bit. So for women out there, you're saying that if having heavy menstruation, they have low iron. It's not just the the low iron that we assume is creating like a low oxygenation. You're, you're showing here the low iron is literally creating a mitochondrial deficit. Correct. Absolutely. Because you're not getting the oxygen in, right? If we go back to here, right? Mitochondria, what do we need to get into the mitochondria? Oxygen. What's one of the big carrying capacities for oxygen in the body? Hemoglobin and then iron affects hemoglobin and red blood cells, right? Hemoglobin is part of the red blood cell carrying capacity and we need the iron to really keep the hemoglobin levels up so it can carry enough oxygen. Wow. So there's why you're tired. Could be, yep. On, and then of course, all, all of the other nutrients play a role, not enough of the amino acids. The only uh, issue with this graph, any biochemists that are looking on, I think the only thing it's missing is really the FADH2. So it should, so all these things, they're just reducing compounds. Really, the whole goal of this Krebs cycle to run is just grabbing hydrogens. And then once we grab these hydrogens, um, these things get cleaved off, and then it, it generates ATP. What's happening there? And all these things like hydroxymethylglutarate, these are, right, these are all driven through CoQ10, right? We need CoQ10 to make that happen. Now, for people like supplementing ketones, if you go back up to the top there, you can basically kind of inject your own spark plug into the cycle, I guess, right? If you're taking exogenous ketones, what is that doing in relationship to this whole cycle? It's giving you more beta hydroxybutyrate. The problem is your body's going to primarily want to use that when insulin levels are lower. So you have to keep your insulin levels in check. If not, you're not setting your physiology up to want to burn that. Is you're probably going to pee it okay. out more like more than likely versus burn it because typically your body has an enzyme called hormone sensitive lipase where it wants to break down fat and convert more of these ketones hormone sensitive lipase is inverse with insulin so higher your hormone sensitive lipase is you need lower insulin to make that happen so the lady who eats the donut and then goes to the store and buys her exogenous ketones, she's wasting her Probably life. not as good. There may be some mild benefits that you get cognitively just because your brain has some additional fuel to run on. If people's brains are insulin resistant, they may have a lot of sugar from that donut, but their cells in their brain may be so numb to it that they may not be able to access it. So some ketones could be helpful, but in the end, you want to fix the insulin resistance. If you're going to do it, try doing both. Don't just do the ketones. Try to do both if you can. And you can make your own ketones too for free. Yeah, that's how you're doing it. You're keeping your insulin in check and you're going to start making your own 100%. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That was that's awesome. Neat. Very cool, guys. Well, hope you guys enjoyed um, today's podcast. We're trying to be a little bit more visual, you know, go into some hard, hard sciencey stuff, but, you know, just kind of zoom out. Like, what's the take home, right? The take home is don't put junky toxins in that screw up your mitochondria, right? antibiotics. I mean, antibiotics, you know, if, if you have an acute infection that's not resolving, you know, you got to do what you got to do, right? You have an acute pneumonia, you got to do what you got to do. Talk to your doctor about it. Just don't go to antibiotics all the time as your first line defense. Try to do some more natural things to fix it. Number two, you know, try to be aware of mold in your environment. Make sure you're not getting exposed to pesticides, chemicals, heavy metals. Uh, make sure you're doing your best to hydrate, right? We need water to make this whole thing work too, okay? I would say after that, make sure you have your macronutrients dialed in good quality protein, fats, and carbohydrates, organic sources. Dial in your carbs so you're not insulin resistant and make sure your inflammation is good. Inflammation helps with oxygenation and blood flow. 
Then after that, we can look at using supplemental nutrients. In my line and at Evans line, we have Mito Supports products. Mine's Mito Synergy. Evans is Mito Boost. We'll put links down below. Those products have a lot of these nutrients. It's going to have the ribose, the creatine, the carnitine, the B vitamins. It's going to have the CoQ10. It's going to have uh, actually Krebs cycle intermediary compounds like fumarate, malate, succinate, all those different nutrients to run those pathways better. Of course, that all sits on top of a solid diet. Don't take supplements if you're going to eat crap. Eat really great and then say, okay, now I'm going to work on enhancing it. And again, we can run testing on organic acids to look at some of these intermediary nutrients like citrate, cisaconitate, succinate, fumarate, malate. We can actually test them, which is pretty cool. Yeah, the testing is the best part because you you know if you actually need it. I can tell you the average person has mitochondrial problems. So in general, could you just take this? I kind of call it a multi for the mitochondria. Could you just take that test, you know, like a guess and check? You could, but we like to see the data. And obviously, my biggest thing is looking for mold colonization, candida overgrowth, clostridia, some of these gut infections and how that affects your brain chemistry too. So when you do the oat, you really are getting the best bang for your buck in terms of testing. Like if you could only do one test out there, I think the oat would probably be the number one most important one. 110%. Anything else you want to say, Evan? Uh, if people need help, they can reach out to you worldwide or me worldwide, uh, Dr. J at justinhealth.com justinhealth.com, me, Evan at evanbrand.com. And we would love to chat with you about your symptoms, your goals, and we'll tell you if you're a good fit for care. So please feel free to reach out. Look forward to helping you. Excellent. And again, justinhealth.com here. And then if you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, put them down below. Let us know kind of what you're doing, what's working. That really helps us out as well. Very cool. All right, guys. Well, you guys have a phenomenal day here and we'll be in touch. Take care, y'all. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Right,